Hi everybody. Um, today I want to talk about some work we've been doing um, in the context of touch sensing for um, robot manipulation tasks. This is work that we've done at the NVIDIA Research Lab in Seattle uh, together with various interns, um, as you will then also see. Um, and we've been mostly working with uh, the Syntouch, the biotech sensors. And of course, I'm excited to see all these new developments and um, just the sensor that the digit sensor looks like a really uh, exciting uh, development going on. Um, I hope that some of the insights we, we, we got uh, also translate, of course, to other sensors. Um, so um, how I organized this was kind of by what kind of data we collect in order to maybe uh, learn a sensor model or calibrate a certain sensor model. Um, and th the first very short section is about work where we're trying to learn something about touch sensors with kind of a minimal amount of supervision, where we're just collecting sensor traces and then um, apply a framework called self-supervised learning in order to learn kind of predictive models of touch sensing. And then um, the next step is if you want to put a little bit more, let's say, modeling effort into the sensor collection um, process itself, then um, you can use, for example, um, tracking techniques to track the object that the robot is interacting with. And maybe through these, you can then also extract a bit more um, higher level or more explicit model information about what's going on um, with the physical interactions between, for example, the sensor or the robot and the and, and the environment itself. And um, then on the third part, I want to talk about one effort that we um, started recently, which is on really going for kind of a fully calibrated setup where we went all out on the modeling side and saw how far we can get with this and which on the longer run hopefully will also lend itself to learning or to, to, um, to designing a very realistic uh, simulation-based uh, touch sensor simulations that you can also then use for control and learning. And then um, given time constraints, I think I started at, let's say, 7.58, so I assume I have a little bit longer than the 8.30 a.m. time, uh, Seattle time, I must say. Um, uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about where we are using vision only for manipulation, also just to put this kind of into context, and then I'll conclude at the end. But let me first briefly talk about um, how we can use pure sensor traces. Um, first of all, again, the sensor we're using is a biotech sensor. Um, it's kind of this, this deformable fingertip um, that, has, uh, that mostly consists of kind of a deformable elastomeric skin, this green skin that you can see on the left side here. And inside, um, and th this finger is then a, um, a conductive fluid and the sensing itself happens at the core of that finger using 19 electrodes that provide impedance information. And this impedance changes depending on kind of how this uh, fluid field inside the finger deforms based on interactions with objects. Uh, here's just an example of what this data looks like, um, where especially in the middle section, the 19 electrodes uh, are colored by the responses they are giving as the finger is interacting with surfaces. Now, the problem is that these electrodes, they do not provide directly, let's say, immediate force information. And they are also uh, not necessarily um, very well localized with respect to where the finger itself is making contact with an object and, this, and what kind of shape the object has. So that kind of information has to be um, inferred through hopefully the learning processes or modeling processes. By the way, I, I hope that the videos um, get through reasonably well. Um, uh, if not, I might have to stop them once in a while. But this is work that um, Giovanni Sutanto did with us um, as an intern. Uh, we published this at ICRA last year. And um, again, in this first part, it's really about um, using minimal supervision in order to learn a sensor model that you can then use for control. And this is, of course, very much in line with the recent advances that you can see in deep learning, where um, various people, leading people in, in the field, in the community, like Jan Le Kuhn, Jeff Hinton, 
also mentioned very clearly that um, self-supervised training um, is of course um, a, a, a very important direction for making deep learning techniques viable in the real world. Um, so the idea here is that um, we have a robot platform, as you can see here on the right, and we um, have the fingertip just interacting with objects. And the only supervision is kind of the relative motion of the finger in the 3D space. And then we collect these 19 dimensional electrode measurements. And then based on that information, we want to learn a model for these electrodes. Let me first show you here the video on the right. So where again, the finger is moved to make certain kinds of contacts with surfaces. Okay, here's just a rotational motion. Here's the same now see it's showing in the internal kind of simulated model of the, of the robot, but that is not explicitly actually used in the, in the process. You can also do then, for example, a translational motion where the finger is moving forward and backward. And again, for this data set, what we collect is the relative motion of the finger as we're getting through the kinematics, through the um, joint sensors of the robot arm. And along with those, we collect uh, measurements of these electrodes. And then you use um, uh, deep learning techniques in order to learn a dynamics model that say, given electrode measurement at time t, given relative motion or control of the fingertip in the, in the finger frame of reference, um, you want to predict future um, electrode measurements. And rather than learning this mapping just from 19D to 19D, uh, what you want to develop is a technique that first mapped, maps the um, raw measurements to a lower dimensional latent space, and also impose additional structure on that latent space such that um, the, the um, changes in latent space are correlated with changes in the pose space of the finger, which means straight motion in the finger should hopefully relate to straight motion in that latent space between points in this embedding, okay? And once we have that, um, you can then do control using this embedded space where, for example, you put the finger on a surface and you give it as a goal, a measurement that the robot should sense, that the finger should sense um, as a target. And then the system knows what controls to apply in order to achieve a certain, let's say, measurement configuration. And this way of phrasing goals in the measurement space, in the sensing space, is pretty popular, um, especially in end-to-end -end deep learning. Um, I must say it clearly also has limitations because the question is always like, how do you really specify a goal in a, in a general way? Um, because you cannot always predict the desired measurements. But anyway, this works um, reasonably well here then, where now you can see in this case, where um, the robot in this case is given a goal measurement such that the part that you can see here, that red mark piece on the fingertip should sense the contact. And based on this learned model, it now knows, the controller knows that it has to actually rotate the finger in order to achieve this desired target contact. Okay. Here you can see this again, but now highlighted uh, the contact point as extracted from the sensor measurement, which is not used explicitly in this model here. You Here's another one now for a sliding motion, for example, where the, the sensor knows or the model learned that it has to pull the finger back. So again, this is very intuitive in the sense of where um, you're placing the finger on a surface, imagine, and you're closing your eyes, and now you're trying to achieve a certain a desired kind of um, contact with the surface. And this model that uh, Giovanni learned here then was able to give you the controls, like how you need to rotate or slide or translate the finger in order to achieve, achieve this desired configuration. The nice thing about this framework, again, is that uh, you can do so with just a minimum amount of supervision. The, the disadvantage at this point is that these kind of models are um, reasonably limited uh, with, how, with their generality and to how many different um, tasks they can be applied. Okay, so uh, now I wanna go to uh, 
um, some work that we've done where we try to provide in the data collection process some more supervision in order to train, learn models for the Syntouch sensor, the biotech. So you can imagine here, for example, it's a setting where we have an object, a box, and on the right-hand side here, you can see the Syntouch, and we are interacting with these objects in the world um, by just pushing them around, right? And this is um, in the full um, 3D space. Um, in all, what we need in this setup is we need a 3D model of the objects. And once we have this, we can use a framework that we developed um, a while ago called Dart. Tanner Schmidt developed that, where you can, where we use a depth camera to accurately track an object as it's moving in the space and also track the robot, as you can see here, hopefully on the, the video on the right, where the gray points are the depth camera measurements. And you can see how we can track both the objects and the robot itself, okay? So once we have that information, um, Bala Sundaralingam, he developed a technique that can use this information now um, along with, with a dynamics model for the forces involved in order to push an object. So you can see here on the right, where um, we, again, we first use DART to uh, track the objects. And then based on the, the fingertip position and the object position estimated over time, he's trying to determine at every time step the forces that were necessary to explain the motion of the object, okay? taking into account both the linear motion and the angular, the rotational motion of the object, okay? So you can see here on the lower part, you'll now see a little animation showing a top view of that motion, okay? So here first the object is being pushed and then down there, you can see the motion of the object and alongside also um, he's estimating the 3D force vector that explains that motion using this physical interaction model. Okay, one limitation of this is that it is using DART, the tracking as kind of a ground truth system. So also published in ICRA last year, um, Sasha Lambert developed a technique that uses factor graphs in order to come up with a more accurate modeling of the contact between the finger and um, the object. Um, as you could see in the upper left part here, if you just use DART, the finger might not actually be in contact with the object itself. So there might be whatever, two, three, four millimeters offset. And again, he developed a technique that doesn't only estimate um, forces between the, the fingertip and the object, but also re-estimates the poses so that they are physically consistent with the context. You can see this now in the animation here on the right side. Okay, where you can see that the contact point between the fingertip and the object is always nicely on the surface and thereby it can of course explain the kind of motion that we're observing much better. Okay, so this is just a way of refining those estimates by combining DART with this um, uh, very explicit contact modeling and making it more consistent. So based on this kind of sensor data now, Bala, Bala then learned a sensor model that goes from electrode measurements to um, 3D force vector, 3D, uh, the magnitude of the force and the direction of the force. And once you have such an explicit model, you can incorporate it into a controller and start manipulating object. So on the left-hand side, for example, what he demonstrated is that you can pick up um, deformable objects. So this is a bottle that you can squeeze and again, he's using in real time the forces um, extracted from the electrode measurements of these three fingertips. You can also contact for, uh, uh, determine when the object, for example, touches the surface again, so that you know when you have to release the object. On the right-hand side, you can see an even more subtle kind of placement operation, which is not so easy to put it on that surface so that it doesn't fall over, okay? Um, and again, this is the advantage of this kind of slightly more model-based approach that once you have this um, force model for the, for the sensors, you can actually incorporate them into um, standard kind of controllers for this setting. Um, here's another task where we now incorporate that more into a reactive system where um, the overall approach does the following. So here we want to, for example, pick up this 
cup that you can see here on the left side. Okay, we're using an Allegro hand, again, with the biotex on there. And it's uh, mounted on a KUKA robot. And what, we, what the system does is the following. Uh, we first use a, a depth camera to um, detect the object using, I think in this case was still post CNN, but um, kind of a 6D object pose estimation framework for estimating where the cups are. So here are two cups, as you can see. Then based on the cup position, we can um, generate target poses for the fingertips where um, the Allegro fingertips should go. You can see these here on the right side, these little red dots, those are target poses for the fingertips. Okay, so all of this is estimated in real time. These poses now um, are sent as goal points to RMPs, which are Riemannian motion policies, which is a reactive um, control regime that then reactively kind of controls the, the Allegro hand and the KUKA arm in order to achieve these goal points. Okay, and then once it's there, it's closing them in order to make contact with the object. And once it's making contact, we're using the tactile feedback that Bala was able to learn based on his data in order to, um, to, um, to control first how the cup is being held by the robot and also when we want to place it to determine when the placement happened. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll show you just a video of how this now works. On the right hand side, you can see the dart estimate along with the post estimate uh, with the detection of these objects. Okay, and the robot now tries to put it back onto the other cup. But Carl is not nice and just keeps on teasing the robot and we keep track of all of this in real time. And in this case, in this video, as you can see, actually, the goal point is not defined with respect to um, the fingertips of the robots, but the goal point for the motion controller is actually defined with respect to the cup where it wants to place it. If you look here on the right side of this video, I hope you can see my mouse well, the goal point is red dot. This is the goal point where the cup wants to move, which is defined relative to the target placement. Okay, and all of this is then fed into these Riemannian motion policies to generate the controls. So you can see here that the robot is then actually able to pretty gently place this object back down onto the other one. Okay, so this was now kind of um, going from um, almost unlabeled data to a more um, sophisticated, let's say, labeling effort where we're using visual tracking together with contact information in order to provide the supervised data that we need to learn the mapping from electrode measurements to forces um, actually being applied to the fingertip, okay? Um, but so far, all of this, what it gave us was kind of the 3D um, force vector, but often these models don't even give you exact information about which point on the fingertip um, is in contact with the object. And what it clearly doesn't give you is anything, any information about the actual deformation of the fingertip. So where we wanted to go in this next step is if we can learn um, a much more detailed model of the real physical interaction between the fingertip itself and, and the objects, okay? And that gets us to kind of a, a, a much more um, stronger effort on the calibration side in order to collect this kind of data that we need for these more sophisticated models, okay? So what we used was the following. We used an ABB Yumi robot. So they are a, a very precise um, and repeatability on achieving um, certain points, configurations in the configuration space of the robot. Um, in front of the robot, we placed what you can see here in the middle, where we took the biotech, okay? We 3D printed, and this is work that was led by, by Yashraj Narang, so who's a research scientist in the lab. Um, and this is a paper that's gonna be published at RSS this year. Um, so 
what he did is we 3D printed this kind of array on which we can also then with a 3D printing printed holding in here, we can place a biotech sensor in a, in a very accurate, precise position. Um, this plate is also mounted on a 6D force torque sensor so that we can measure in real time, of course, um, the forces being applied to the biotech. And um, in order now to calibrate that, um, that array or that measurement device here relative to the Yumi, what Yash did is he also printed these in the 3D printed process, designed these holes that go around that array here. He then printed a pin, a pin that you can then place into the Yumi's gripper or into the, the, the end effector part. So it's not actually held by the gripper that wouldn't be precise enough. And then by inserting that pin into these holes, as you can see here on the right, and doing this for all of them, you can then estimate a very, very precise position of the biotech relative to the Yumi. So Yash found out that calibration error is then about one millimeter over all of the relative pose of the Yumi and now the biotech sensor. Then if you look here on the right, for example, what we can do is you can now 3D print um, a, an indenter, like in this case, this black kind of 3D printed device. You can now start poking the biotech sensor. That poking will also be measured. You can get the biotech electrode measurements, but also you get the force torque measurements from the 6D um, force torque sensor, okay? And because everything is 3D printed, we also have, of course, a full 3D shape model for everything that's going on, okay? So if this is where um, Yash would have, would have added and just collected that data, that would not have given you any, let's say, information about deformations or things that are really going on with the sensor. All that would have given you is information about electrode measurements and the 6D resulting um, force talks on the, on the biotech, but nothing about deformations. So what Yash then did um, is first of all, again, he developed different indenters, nine different indenter types. And here in the middle, you can see one example for how this um, process then goes, where you can see in this video, kind of the Yumi now poking that biotech sensor various times. So overall, we have more than um, 300 unique trajectories. So this data set will be, will be made available to people. Okay, so you can use that. Um, but the key thing is, again, um, we wanted also to know what is going on in the Hello? Hello? Element may they, they agreed with us that Yash now knows much more about the physics underneath the biotech than Excuse others. me, Dieter, your internet went out for a few seconds. Do you mind go back a few okay. seconds? Yeah, let me go back. Was like on this slide? Are we good again? No, no, previous one. So oh. you're about to finish the previous slide. Oh, okay. But did you see the video? Uh, I think not. Oh, okay. So in the middle now, if you look in the middle, you can see now how the Yumi is kind of poking that sensor. And this is sped up here, of course. But how the Yumi is poking the biotech with these different indenters. Okay. Does it work? Did that now work? Yeah, it works well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, he then generated, again, with these nine different indenters, he did more than uh, 300 um, different trajectories on how to poke the objects, uh, how to poke uh, the, the, the biotech with them. And that uh, data set will be made available 
to the community, of course, right? So that you can use it for your research. But again, stopping at this does not yet provide you any information about what's really going on at the physical level with, with the um, biotech sensor itself or with the deformation. So what he then developed, he used a tool called Envil, um, for, which is a finite element modeling tool and developed a, a very fine grained, a finite element mo model of the syntax. You can see here on the left. So he modeled um, that there is a, a fluid inside. He modeled that you have a deformable surface skin. He had a 3D model of the interior core of the sensor. And uh, now he can, for example, see here on the left, kind of the resulting really fine grained strains and forces that are occurring as, for example, an indenter might kind of poke against the sensor. Um, if you look on the middle part now, you can see kind of a short um, animation showing these indentation events where the coloring shows um, the strains on the surface elements of the syntouch. Okay, so this is a, um, a very accurate, again, finite element simulation of the syntouch interacting with these indenters. And um, what, first of all, me as a computer scientist, I would never have been able to develop something as kind of this whole calibration setup. It's pretty amazing how Yash did that. But I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool that actually he was also then able to show that, um, that the, the model is actually pretty accurately predicting the forces. So what you can see here on the lower part is if you look at the lower left, is the following. So he calibrated his finite element method, which means he calibrated, for example, the um, how deformable the skin is. And he did this by using the data collected with one of the indenters, okay? And the problem is that you don't have ground truth data for these deformations. So what he did was the following. He took the finite element method, uh, method to first of all predict all the, the deformations. From those, he then predicted the resulting overall 3D force that would be applied to the biotech. And that he was able to compare to the measured forces um, through the 6D force torque sensor placed underneath the biotech. Um, and then if you look here on the lower right, he was able to um, also predict measurements for other kind of indenters um, with respect to the resulting forces on the, um, on the um, force torque sensor, again, placed underneath the biotech. Um, so which means his predictions very well matched the actual measured forces, okay? So just, just to repeat what's going on here to make this clear. So, what we're using as input is um, the joint measurements of the ABB, UMI. Um, those give us through then the forward kinematics. We know where the indenter is in the simulated model. We know where the indenter is relative to the biotech. We feed that information into the finite element method to see, to predict how the biotech would deform or react to this indentation process. Through the final element method, we then also predict the overall resulting force. And that resulting force is then compared to the force that you would have, that you measured with the force torque sensor. Okay, and he got a very good matching between those. Then with this kind of data, what you can do is you can actually use the electrode uh, measurements and you train, uh, for example, a point net plus plus structure and now we can predict, for example, um, the location of the contact very well. We can predict the 3D force vector. We can train a network to predict that from the electrode measures. But also what I think uh, has never been done before is we can also predict from the electrode measurements the deformation field of the surface of the, con of the sensor itself, okay, of the biotech sensor. And the idea is what you can do with these deformation fields is also that hopefully this will lend itself to much better simulations of these contact sensors. 
The one thing we have not yet been able to reliably do is predict the other way around where we say, imagine the simulator tells you a certain deformation that you should get based on interacting with objects. And from those simulations, we would like to be able to simulate the resulting electrode measurements that the biotech would give us. If we can do that, then we can train models and controllers purely in simulation and, um, and hopefully apply them on the real system. Okay, so this is still ongoing work. Um, in this vein of simulating um, robots and contacts, we are also looking now at here, this is a work led by Carl uh, Van Wyck right now, is where uh, we're developing a, a hand model that also has deformable surfaces. As you can see here on the right, that the surface of the fingertip, for example, kind of deforms uh, in order to make this contact with this, um, this kind of block that you can see here. Okay, and the idea is that hopefully with such a system, we can investigate, um, first of all, we get a much better simulation of what happens with deformable um, manipulation, but hopefully we can also then simulate the deformations and the contact forces and can see what could you do if you had access to this kind of sensor information. Because right now, if we look at the contact sensors that we have, they are still pretty impoverished in the sense of that they are typically mostly on the fingertip, but not on the whole surface of the hand. And in such simulations, we could at least play through these what if scenarios, right? And um, here's some work that Yash is doing right now also, um, where we're trying to see how we can use these kind of finite element method simulations in order to drive controllers to pick up very small objects. For example, now if you look at the middle, this is kind of a deformable sensor gripper hand picking up a, a very thin washer where the controller is driven by just the overall force measured through this simulated system. On the right, it's even now picking up a very small steel pin, kind of like a needle. And again, the controller is driven by this deformation model. Um, again, at this point, I don't want to go much more into detail. This is very much ongoing work, um, but I think it's a very interesting direction so that hopefully we can learn these controllers really through simulation. Okay. Um, if I have time, I can just briefly. Okay. Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, five minutes. Or... Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Then um, I just so so far I focused on, let's say, just touch sensing uh, for manipulation and also kind of using vision like for visual tracking in order to get training data or detect these objects. Um, I just want to give two examples of work that we've been doing on, let's say, mostly vision only manipulation, where one is um, this work that was published ICCV last year by Arsalan Musavian, um, where we are learning deep networks that can take an in point, input point cloud and um, generate, that, that are trained to generate grasps, six degree of freedom grasp for these objects. Um, we can combine this then with a evaluation technique that can actually estimate how good these grasps are that are being sampled, and then also refine these grasps so that they can be executed uh, more robustly. Here you can see some examples. Um, this is a robot picking up some of these objects where um, importantly, the system was only trained in simulation. No real data was used for the, um, for the, for, for the training. And these objects are not known to the robot, which means these objects were not part of the simulated training data. So this is now really going towards pretty robust 60 post gra uh, object grasping in the real world. So this initial work assumed that the objects were kind of individual, but um, now we're moving towards where the idea is, okay, you have a cluttered scene. Um, you can then use um, some work that my student Chris Shee did on kind of um, segmenting individual objects. And then you can use these techniques now to, after segmenting an object, 
you can generate graphs that are also collision free and you can do more sophisticated reasoning. There's a paper coming up um, that Adita Murali did as an intern with us um, that uh, operates more in cluttered scenes for manipulation using these grasp samplers that's coming up um, at Ikra. I don't know, yeah, obviously this week. Um, it's, I think, one of the finalists for best manipulation paper awards um, and also best student paper award. And by the way, Aditya is gonna uh, just joined us as a research scientist also at the NVIDIA, the research lab. So this is a very exciting direction. Another thing is I want to highlight actually how good people are at manipulating things without any kind of um, touch sensing. So here we did build a system called DexPilot that will also be published in ICRA here, um, is where we're tracking the human hand to um, remote control the Allegro hand. And let me show you here an example. I hope you can see this in the video which I mean kind of highlights, on the one hand side, first of all, this is a pretty significant system where we use four real sense cameras to track the human hand um, and the articulation. Then that is being mapped over to the Allegro hand. And this is work um, led by Anko Handa and again, Carl van Wick. Um, and then a human is actually able to do pretty sophisticated manipulation tasks, right? And uh, this is done without any touch sensing. There's no touch feedback at all. And I hope you can see that a person is actually able to do pretty interesting things here. Here you can see actually, um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm not gonna show this till the end, but here actually they are able to get a, whatever, $10 bill out of that wallet, right? Which I, I just wanna show to highlight that um, just based on good visual reasoning, and understanding that humans are able to do very sophisticated things without touch, but that by no means do I say touch is not important, right? Um, so now let me come to the conclusions. So as I just showed you, I think visual information is of course crucial for any kind of pre-touch reasoning and control. I think touch is really important with respect to this kind of just at the last moment, having robustness, any kind of in-hand manipulation capabilities crucial where you use touch sensing, fine grain control tasks, also small objects when um, the visual information isn't there anymore, um, insertion tasks and things like that. I think touch sensing is gonna be really crucial. Um, um, on our work, we mostly used vision and touch kind of as separate modalities. We did combine them, but not uh, um, in kind of learning joint embeddings, for example. I think on the one hand side, um, self-supervised training, as the work that Giovanni uh, hinted at is a very promising direction because it requires only a minimum amount of supervision. Um, and because of that, you can collect a lot of data in the real world. The problem so far is still that I think um, the models are not quite as general as some of these physics-based models that you can apply in many different settings where the self-supervised training so far has been applied in more limited tasks. But I think, um, that is not a fundamental kind of limitations. And I can imagine with more data collection, more substantial um, experiments that can be expanded. Um, I also showed that I think thorough data collection where you really put a lot of uh, modeling effort into the data collection process itself, we can then learn more expressive models, which I think then can also lead to good simulation models. And I hope that ultimately we can get to simulation models of context, touch, and deformation that are so accurate that we can actually train both perception, visual perception, and touch feedback in simulation and train policies for these so that they can work in the real world. And I think this would be, of course, a very significant step forward, but there's still uh, quite some work to be done to do this in a very general setting that, such that it's also hopefully um, independent of the sensor itself um, and applies to different kinds of sensors. But I think in general, we all agree that we still need um, better touch sensors that also have a much higher coverage, which means so that uh, they touch, th that they cover, for example, the whole, the palm and the whole fingers of these objects. And um, I wasn't able to unfortunately see Gordon's talk. I must admit I was still asleep, but um, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty sure he, he talked about some of his 
really, really exciting work in uh, providing more coverage for sensing. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Professor Fox, for sharing. Okay, some quick questions from the audience. Uh, one audience asked about, like, uh, what's the performance would uh, Detroit in data plug if latency was introduced? Have you tested that? Which, um, which one is, which question is that? So can you say it uh, again? I was looking at the chat at the same time. I'll just listen yeah, to you. Yeah, it's a question from Jakub Tomasek. Uh, so about the latencies in Dex, uh, Dex Pilot. Oh, so yes. That oh, have lots the, of the latency. That's, that's a great question. There is actually a tiny bit of latency from going from the tracking all the way, because we need to track the, the hands, which has a tiny bit of latency. And then from there, we need to go to, all the way to the control of the hand. So that is why the demonstration that you saw, they were all kind of sped up a little bit. So we cannot do at this point, like really fast finger motion. That is where the latency um, would be a real problem. So in that sense, we don't need to um, add artificial latency to make it uh, more difficult. It is already not trivial, but I think it's a very promising direction. Can I? Uh, Can I? Another, another question from me. Uh, so you talk about generalization of the system, like how the uh, vision touch uh, control loop can generalize to different manipulation tasks or to different shapes of the objects. So it's a challenging task, I guess, is for everyone sitting here. But have you, figure out, uh, have you thought about if, the, uh, if it's hard for generalization, whether it's because like we don't have a large enough data set or the model is not good enough or simply there's not enough data from the sensor you're using. So how can you get yeah. some insight into that? So I think you mean with respect to supervised learning, for example, also, right? I, I, assume, I think one of the problems is really that so far, first of all, I mean, all these different tasks, right, put together, it's just extremely complicated, right? Which means if you really want to have a good coverage, you just need to generate huge amounts of data. And it's not sufficient to just collect, let's say, touch sensor data. But you also want to collect alongside with that the visual data so that you can learn joint controllers that use vision and touch. And um, covering that space of possible interaction with these objects is just tremendously hard. Um, I think um, what's, from my perspective, actually very exciting is this recent work that we've seen, especially also in the deep learning vision community on contrastive learning, where uh, with weak super supervision, there has been some really nice progress where people were able to use um, very minimal amounts of kinds of um, supervision to learn very powerful feature embeddings for visual data. And I think these kind of techniques, if we can combine them with very, very large scale data sets, I hope that we can hopefully transfer some of these successes to um, manipulation. So, so it's on the one hand side, uh, just to, to get back to your question, I think it's a combination of just the complexity of these problems. I think it's much more complex than recognizing um, an apple in an image. Um, at the same time, also getting the right kind of supervision for that data is also very, very complex and difficult. I and I saw there was one question about a paper. I think I have all the references in the slides, um, but of course, um, uh, I can point you at that. Just send me an email. Hmm. Hi, Dita. Hey, thanks for hey, joining God. us. Hey, and congratulations on the prize. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, your finite element uh, modeling is very cool. Do you know if you're only modeling one particular biotech sensor, or uh -huh. is it applicable yeah. across? That's a great question. And I also see Yash is actually here uh, in, in the Zoom meeting. Um, so actually, he did it for three different biotech sensors. And at this point, um, sadly, those, those accurate models do not transfer from one biotech sensor to another one. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll just add something here. So the let him find the element model does transfer from sensor to sensor. The neural network predictions do not transfer that well from sensor to sensor. So the finite yeah. element model is tested over the entire data set of different sensors, different inventors, and so on. Which, given the generalizability, suggests to me that 
the mechanical behavior of the sensors is highly repeatable from sensor to sensor. Okay. Okay. But because neural network predictions seem to be less predictable, uh, I think that suggests to us that maybe some of the electronics from sensor to sensor may have less repeatability. Yeah. Okay. So one hope would be if we can train a general model based on, let's say, whatever, 20 of these sensors, then hopefully you could learn a general model and then for one specific sensor, you just have a reasonably simple additional calibration procedure to refine the model for that specific sensor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the hope would be clearly that you do not have to go through this calibration process for every single biotech you want to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.